too long. It's good to be home. Of course. Which newly there is the exquisite Miss Ma The mild man's and charisma. As is yours. Another Bridgerton making her dinner. Francesca is very quiet. Mm -hmm. Is there anything we can do to help? Playing piano forte in this house. Certainly not. I've been outside your door all morning. Yeah, well, Perhaps we do not need to worry so much. Chance aside, there is all certainly need someone dash. Their pairing brings some. Is that a brother? Colin. My late arrival. I got stuck in present. Yeah. <laughs> Mrs. Varley, Lorraine Ashbourn welcomes Penelope Featherington, Nicola Coughlin and Lady Portia, Polly Walker upon their arrival at the start of this Bridgerton episode. We get to know the recently made debutantes, such as Miss Hartigan, Molly Jackson Shaw, Miss Stowell, Kitty Devlin, Miss Milhotra, Benita Sandhu, and Miss Kenworthy, Cesley Hope. Ella Brucolari's character, Miss Barragan, sticks out among the others. This year, another Bridgerton will be making her stage debut. People wait with anticipation to speak with Hannah Dodd's character, Francesca Bridgerton. They discover her practicing the piano. Ruth Jemmel's character, Lady Violet Bridgerton, is addressed by the others. It is, Francesca argues, only another day. In addition, Lady Whistledown writes about the gentleman. Outside, girls try to get Colin's attention. Luke Newton's character Colin informs Jonathan Bailey's character Lord Anthony Bridgerton that he became caught up in presentation traffic. Following the introduction, Anthony, the others, and Colin discuss Colin's adventure. Colin is adamant that he needs this time away. The girls exhibited before Queen Charlotte, Golda Rosheuvel do not seem to impress her. Violet discusses her debut with Francesca. Francesca finds the thought of owning a home appealing. Queen Charlotte is then given them. Charlotte is reminded by Brimsley, Hugh Sachs that she has luck with Bridgertons. Harry Dankwith, James Foon is heard by Portia and Varley discussing the idea of holding additional weddings. In the process, Portia queries if he would keep spending Aunt Petunia's money. According to Penelope, Aunt Petunia was liked. Varley asks Portia in private if anybody would think a spinster who never possessed anything more than a donkey cart could give her a wealth. Portia speculates that she could have been concealing currency jars beneath the floorboards. Varley gives her a heads up that the truth will eventually come to light. A few of the females appear to be fixated on Colin. He informs the girls that although he has no desire to marry, his travels have taught him to be prepared for anything. Before Cressida confronts Penelope, she notices Eloise, Claudia Jesse as she is leaving. Penelope is watching him, but Eloise interferes and moves Cressida, Jessica Madsen away from her. She hears the other females discussing their desires in a man. Francesca can only express her desire for kindness. Violet discusses going back with Kate, Simone Ashley. They talk about Eloise and Francesca. Violet acknowledges that she doesn't comprehend Eloise's recent acquaintance. Violet is not going to get involved just yet. As soon as she locates a dower house, she swears to move in. Kate is happy to have her nearby. A Joa Ando's Lady Agatha Danbury addresses them. Colin keeps hanging around with chicks. Others are informed by Portia that there would be no more laying claims. In a wool, the late Lord Featherington left her daughters the estate in the event that any of them bears fruit. Colin discusses his attire with Penelope. Later, Portia confides in Penelope that she finds solace in the knowledge that she would always have her back. Penelope visits Genevieve de la Croix, Catherine Drysdale the following day in order to buy a new clothing. She says that in order to move away from her mother and sisters, she has to find a spouse. Penelope shares with her her ideal spouse. She requests something akin to what they addressed in Paris. Colin presents a gift to his mother. Colin hands Eloise a book with rare Bavarian literature as soon as she walks into the room. She claims to have started reading Emma. According to Eloise, the book has truth, comedy, and the difficulties of friendship. She clarifies that when no one else would, Cressida is the one who shows her kindness. Eloise claims that Penelope and she have become less close. Eloise has chosen to align with the victorious side after Lady Whistledown almost destroyed her previous season. Later on, Ray is asked to meet Penelope in the carriage when Eloise runs into her. 
Eloise is informed by Penelope that she shunned society because she wasn't sure if she wanted to see her. She feels grateful that Eloise has kept her secret. Penelope's writings have not pleased Eloise. They now have different lifestyles. Luke Thompson's Benedict tells Anthony he's not sure what to do at this point. Edward Bennett's character Walter Dundas arrives to meet Alice Mondrick, Emma Naomi and Will Mondrick, Martin Zimhangbe. Is Alice aware of her great aunt, Lady Kent? He asks. She gave everything to her son Nicholas when she passed away. The next Baron of Kent will be him. Anthony and Kate have moments in bed. Kate stops him to inform him that tonight is Lady Danbury's ball and that this is her first week as a Viscountess. Her goal is to leave a positive impression. Tonight, Penelope makes the decision to try something a bit different. Soon after, the ball starts. When Cressida notices Penelope's new clothing, she is taken aback. Eloise and Cressida hear other girls discussing needlework. Penelope talks to guys about her interests, which include reading. Eloise attempts to steer the subject in a different direction. To avoid giving Lady Whistledown anything to write about, the guys move away from Penelope. Penelope is brought up to Queen Charlotte by Lady Danbury. Francesca talks to Lord Fife and others about her interests and goals. She makes her fast getaway and informs Antony that she needs some alone time. Violet only needed a moment, he says. Penelope advises Francesca to get out onto the dance floor. Francesca acknowledges that she dislikes attention and that she didn't like the talk with the gentleman. They both acknowledge that growing apart from siblings may be challenging. After dancing, Francesca tells Penelope that she need to follow suit. A few seconds later, Lord Debling checks on Penelope. If she so chooses, he believes she knows how to make one wither. In the end, Cressida tears her garment by treading on it. It was probably an expensive cloth, she informs her. Penelope storms off as Eloise attempts to apologize. Colin follows her after observing her go. Penelope, furious, claims she has no possibilities and is in her third year on the marriage market. Colin says he misses her and wonders why she didn't reply to his letters. He promised everyone he would never court her, she reminded him. She never realized that he was capable of such cruelty. After returning home, Penelope starts writing. Walter Dundas pays Portia a call the next day. She had informed him that her whole money was taken by her cousin Jack Feathering when he left town. He has a signed contract from Jack that says one of her daughters will inherit the estate if she has a male child. There isn't another male heir alive that the Crown is aware of right now. Walter alerts her about the potential turmoil in the event that it turns out the paper is fake. Portia is adamant that the document is authentic. Other than Francesca, Cressida informs Eloise that she has no competitors. Eloise claims that Penelope suffered cruelly at her hands. Finding true friends has been difficult, according to Cressida. The females are usually pitted against each other during the season. In her first season, Cressida says she made an attempt to become friends with Eloise, but Eloise turned her down. She acknowledges that Penelope is not worthy of her time. Kate informs Anthony that she wants to talk to him about something. Kate advises him not to discuss relocation with his mother. She believes they can let his mother to remain a little while longer and prolong their honeymoon. Violet discusses her night with Francesca. Violet hopes that when love finds her, she'll be receptive. Francesca is curious to find out. To make amends for his remarks from the previous season, Colin pays Penelope a visit. He claims he looks for her because he is confident in her ability to uplift him. In order to help her find a spouse, Colin promises to teach her charm. He desires to win back the trust of the individual who showed him appreciation. Penelope acknowledges their friendship and shakes his hand. Penelope starts to worry about what she wrote about him after he goes. Welcome to Lord Kent's new residence. Queen Charlotte thinks Lady Whistledown is being deceptive once more. Penelope reaches over to her sisters for a copy. She corrects everything Whistledown stated concerning Colin. Colin is informed by Eloise that he is featured in the newsletter. It claims that Colin seemed to have fully accepted a new identity. Whistledown wonders if Colin really knows, or if it's just a trick. Colin tells Eloise that although he doesn't give a damn about what she says about him, he will never forgive her for attempting to destroy Lady Crane and Eloise. Colin is unaware of her identity. He'll make sure her life is devastated if he ever finds out. I, I am not choosing one, Abby. I hear my choice last or not. Besides, sparkles. Besides, gentle reader.
in the shelf triumphed over money Sharma at the ripest. A looking. A fact the new. No one touch anything. Waters. Mind you, do not bother Mrs. Carter. Appeared to be priceless. Un Ask. Oh, why worry yourself, Ma? Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> and it is not me. Has most changed? Huh. Never been more wrong about anyone. In real life? I shouldn't. I suppose I can show you. I believe you know Miss Featherington? Discomposed. No. Okay, Is here. he perhaps a good man? Realise the reason she... I believe so. Oh. A pineapple covered in diamonds is being examined by Queen Charlotte, Golda Ross Huvel and Lady Agatha Danbury, a Joa Ando in the opening scene. They chat about the current season. Her Majesty isn't feeling impressed thus far. Not one of the debutantes has made an effort to stand out. The monarch, however, would not allow Lady Whistledown's comments from her most recent booklet to denigrate her. She is going to play the game and prove to this anonymous gossip columnist that she has reason to be terrified. The story then switches to Lady Whistledown, Julie Andrews, who narrates about the many women who were supposedly out of the marriage mart but ended up being married. Wearing one of her stunning new dresses, Penelope Featherington, Nicola Coughlin stands in front of the mirror with her maid. Mrs. Varley, played by Lorraine Ashbourne, says she's relieved Penn's mother didn't force her to throw out the garments. A spectacular tour of their estate is given to Will and Alice Mondrick, Martin Zimhangbe and Emma Naomi, together with their children, one of whom is the new Baron of Kent. They find out that their quarters are on the opposite side of the hallway. Married couples shouldn't sleep in the same room in the ton. Then, Eloise Bridgerton, Claudia Jessie, Colin, Luke Newton, and Benedict, Luke Thompson go along the seafront. Benny makes fun of Eloise for changing into a young woman who fits in with society. When Colin and Penn get back together, they begin with operation, find Penn a husband, that was my invention. He tells Penn to seduce two lords they encounter while out on a walk because he says he wants to see her flirtatious abilities in action. Penn burns and crashes. Later, Francesca, Hannah Dodd and Hyacinth, Florence Hunt join Lady Danbury and Lady Violet Bridgerton, Ruth Gemmell for tea. The Queen isn't quite done with the season, Lady Danbury says. Francesca's future appears bright, since there are plenty of suitors who share her passion for music. Meanwhile, Lady Portia, Polly Walker at the Featherington home gives the talk to her married daughters, Prudence Dankwith, Bessie Carter and Philippa Finch, Harriet Keynes. She inquires as to whether they have performed the horizontal tango, rolled in the hay, and the beast with two backs. Speaking of sultry stuff, Colin finishes off two women's heated and intimate intercourse between the sheets. Penn and Colin later reunite at an open-air market to carry on their instruction. He maintains that she is a natural flirt and doesn't need instruction. Colin remembers how Penn charmed him without hesitation when they initially met as kids. Subsequently, we witness Will and Alice, evidently missing each other, sleeping in their own rooms. Alice goes to the Modishta the next day to have the clothes she inherited from the late Lady Kent altered. Catherine Drysdale's character Genevieve Delacroix advises Alice to spend part of her newfound wealth on more stylish clothing. Francesca and Eloise are also at the Modishta in the meantime. To buy herself more time, Eloise advises Francesca to put off seeking a partner. But Francesca says that she wants to marry as soon as possible since she will be able to live in peace. Benedict, Colin, Gregory, Will Tilston, and Hyacinth engage in a card game in the garden of the Bridgerton residence. Colin gets up from the game to lead Penelope into the drawing room for some role-playing. Penn is reassured by Colin that everyone is continue playing their card game even though Eloise has left. Penn then tries her flirting again, this time on Colin, who is posing as a nobleman at a gala. She shows off her amazing writing abilities by referring to his eyes as the most remarkable shade of blue. When he is nice, they shine even more. Colin leads Penn into the study so she may hide when he hears Eloise and Francesca are going home. There, she discovers his notebook detailing his global adventures. She reads a passage in which Colin says that some of the world's most beautiful ladies are those from Paris. Horrified that she has read his inner thoughts, he walks in. As Colin takes up his journal, Penn apologizes. He accidentally topples a glass case that holds a candle. While attempting to gather the glass fragments, Colin wounds his hand. 
Pen takes immediate action, snatching up a cloth to bandage the wound. It becomes another time of intense sexual tension. Pen then runs away, but not before witnessing Eloise as she exits the room. Everyone gets ready for the upcoming ball that evening. Colin and Eloise go in a carriage together, and Alice is thrilled to discover that the late Lady Kent possessed exquisite jewels. Colin expresses regret for bringing Pen inside the house. He reveals that he has been teaching her things and that she wants to find a spouse. In another scene, Benedict and Colin ask a group of debutantes if the guys will dance that night. Sighing, Benny realizes he has to carry out at least one of his duties as a ton member. Colin and Penn reconcile in the interim. In the meantime, Francesca meets a possible suitor who enjoys music. At first, they get along well since they both adore different composers and their compositions. However, Francesca experiences a unclick and the discussion becomes uninteresting. Lady Danbury and Violet observe the exchange from a distance. Danbury questions whether it would be preferable to let Francesca to function in her own sphere, as it were. Will and Alice at the Kent estate, meanwhile, make the decision to defy some social mores. They want to share a room for sleeping and just dance together during balls. Alice does, however, wish to preserve the jewellery that belonged to her late great-aunt. Afterwards, Lady Whistledown's voice may be heard reading the most recent leaflet that's been going around the ton. Pen wrote nasty things about herself, saying that after that disastrous attempt with Colin, she ought to go back into seclusion. Poor girl of mine, you're not just a wallflower, either. You are indeed a gem. Pen receives criticism from Portia for going above and beyond what is impossible. Oh no, after all that happened with their relative last season, their reputation is already in jeopardy. Pen's maid tells her she has a caller that evening. Colin is here. He expresses regret for all that transpired, including his actions. Pen gives up, thinking there's no hope for her. But before she completely gives up, she asks Colin to give her a kiss. Pen has never received a kiss before. He lies to her at first, then he grants her request. When Poland eventually gives us a kiss, it's amazing. Pen thanks him and walks away, leaving Colin looking visibly startled. Meeting me. I apologize for the late eat. I, 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 by you. Hi. Again, Mama. She was split alphabetically. But I was met with complete unmeek. She waits for the maids to throw out. I think Penelope is quite fort. Are you all right? <laughs> Dearest, just nearly to the clouds, and never rested in only one thing. I hear he is. I just think my mind is elsewhere. S throw it. Uh, one has to fall. And body inside me. <laughs> Bali. Time. Really so, I think. Would you like to come in? But I do hope you find. <laughs> the scene opens with Luke Newton's character Colin Bridgerton dreaming about kissing Nicola Copland's character Penelope Featherington. Compared to their kiss in real life, which was tender and radiated warmth, this one is more hotter and more sensual. Before the kiss deepens, he awakens. We catch the Bridgertons in the drawing room that morning. Ruth Jemmel's character, Lady Violet Bridgerton, begs Hannah Dodd's character, Francesca, to repeat exactly what Queen Charlotte said to her at the last ball. Benedict, Luke Thompson and Hyacinth, Florence Hunter informed by Gregory, will Tilston that he fractured his arm while attempting to view a hot air balloon from the roof. Most of the time, Eloise, Claudia Jesse reads a book quietly. The family later welcomes Colin. Is his brother having a late night? Benedict queries. In another scene, men are preparing a huge hot air balloon for a public show at an open air carnival. Francesca is Her Majesty's Diamond of the Season, and Queen Charlotte, Golda Rosheuvel, and Lady Agatha Danbury, a Joa and O, go over a list of deserving suitors for her. Lord Alfred Debling is mentioned by Lady Danbury. The Queen, though, thinks he's too engrossed in nature to think about getting married. Danbury makes reference to her unwelcome home visitor, but she withholds the name. Penn meets Lady Portia, Polly Walker, Prudence Dankwith, Bessie Carter, and Philippa Finch, Harriet Keynes in the drawing room of the Featherington residence in the meanwhile. It has been a week since her daughter has been withdrawing into her room, remarks Portia. 
Then, Eloise pays Penn a surprise visit. She expresses regret for the rumors that started to circulate about Colin adopting Penn. According to Eloise, she had no intention of sharing the information. Penn responds that if Eloise revealed it on purpose, she wouldn't hold it against her. Eloise wishes Penn well in her search for a spouse. Later, after deciding it's time to reintegrate into society, Penn goes for a stroll. She is the center of attention for everyone. When she and Colin get back together, they awkwardly decide to stop teaching. Then, when Lord Debling, Sam Phillips is staring at the plush animal heads affixed to the wall, the moms at the party chat about him. Joanna Bobbin's character Lady Cooper pushes her daughter Cressida, played by Jessica Madsen to get Debling to wed her. Her parents will find her a spouse if she is unable to locate one on her own. Speaking with Debling, Cressida discusses being a predator rather than a prey. The Featheringtons and Bridgertons show up in the interim. Benedict recognizes the debutante from the previous episode with whom he danced. He makes every effort to elude her. In another passage, Lady Danbury tells Francesca that the lesser lords typically arrive first, followed eventually by the more powerful ones. Eloise and Cressida take a stroll in the park the next day. In an attempt to win Debling over, Cressida confesses her wish to learn more about nature. Given that Eloise is smart, she seeks for her assistance. Later, during an outdoor market, the Featherington, Dankwith, and Finch clan appears to Lord Hawkins' hot air balloon demonstration. Colin locates Penn. To keep the tons from realizing they're talking to each other, the couple pretends to be staring at candies. Penn acknowledges that she's enjoying her time with Debling. They are becoming more intimate. Even though Colin appears unhappy about it, he attempts to hide it. He stares at her lips as she bites into a cupcake. Eloise and Cressida then encounter Debling. Cressida exclaims how much she loves the legendary orc. To impress Debling, Penn and Cressida engage in a not-so-subtle competition to discover who can learn the most about nature. Penn is certain that one should not ignore the sparrow. The Mondricks make the decision somewhere not to go to the event that evening. Will does, after all, miss his club. Even if he stops by sometimes, it's not the same as spending a night there. Alice would like to remain indoors. Benedict, meantime, goes into a tent to listen to Lord Hawkins, Deepak Vehma talk about his creation of the hot air balloon. There, he encounters Hannah New's character Lady Tilly Arnold, a strong-willed woman who silences the males who oppose Hawkins' presentation. Francesca is then introduced to Lord Samadani, David Mumeni, a Marquis from Vienna, by Queen Charlotte. To meet her, he made the special trip to London. Sitting side by side, they stare at the hot air balloon. Penn and Cressida are concurrently carrying on their covert rivalry for Debling's affection. Right now, Prudence and her spouse Harry Dankworth, James Foon choose to have it done next to a tent, out of sight. Prudence pushes Harry as a guy suddenly catches them. He stumbles over one of the ropes that is securing the balloon. The balloon's fastening pegs are pulled out when it comes loose. Wool, Colin, Benedict, and the other guys scramble to seize ropes so they can draw the balloon back to where it was resting. It's a daring deed that only a romantic lead is capable of. The balloon is hurtling toward her when the pen freezes in place. Violet loses her glove when the Bridgerton family shows up at the event later that evening. Daniel Francis's character, Lord Marcus Anderson, takes it up. Before they part, the two momentarily make eye contact. Cressida receives an order from Lady Cooper to get Debling to dance. Not a tight squeeze. Eloise idly strolls around, utterly disinterested in the debutante's discussions about marriage and the wedding day. Lord Samadani and Francesca spend more time together, but when he says he wants eight children, she is overwhelmed. Violet notices that Francesca has left Samadani and goes looking for her when she excuses herself. She is reunited with Lord Anderson. Violet is introduced to him by Lady Danbury as her brother. Francesca encounters Victor Ali's character, John Sterling, the Earl of Kilmartin, outside. He has no problem standing outside by himself in quiet. There's a cozy silence between the two of them. Then Will works at his busy club, behind the bar. Will talks with Jonathan Livingstone's character, Lord Garrett, about the impending hunt to which he was invited. Garrett tells Will that there are boundaries to everything in high society. In another scene, Penn strikes up a conversation with Lord Debling as he brings Cressida some lemonade. She expresses regret for posing as someone she wasn't the day before. Penn doesn't like being in the outdoors and would rather curl up with a nice book. 
Debling says he would much rather wed someone who is exactly who she is. Colin walks up to Penn, obviously hoping to make a declaration of love. But he can't say anything once he sees Penn. My sad infant. Debling suddenly appears and asks Penn to dance. Julie Andrews plays Lady Whistledown, who tells the story of Debling's unexpected courtship of Penn. Lady Whistledown states, it is quite evident that the battle is, in fact, between man and himself in the struggle between man and nature. Colin, who is in love with Penelope, appears disturbed as he watches her dance with another man. I must not rush as I am with child. What is it? She turns help. Many people do much. My other daughter is just... Penelope is sad at that way. I suppose I mostly just enjoy the view. <laughs> we are expecting... Leave none for the Marquis. That is kind of you. Very well. Dearest... I shall return when that thing... I do not... For these past ten years. <laughs> you must forgive me. Please. I am occupied a good one. One person in to become the new Marquis Sutherings. We shall arrange one. You read me too well. That is the cake. I believe. There is a call. I'm certain. I am of Kill Martin. It is a pleasure to Can I join you a moment? The scene opens with Philippa Finch, Harriet Keynes, Lady Portia Featherington, Polly Walker, and Prudence Dankworth, Bessie Carter listening in on Penelope Featherington, Coughlin and Lord Alfred Debling, Sam Phillips. She's being visited by Lord Debling, who brought her a plant so she might experience nature without having to leave her house. Newton's character Colin Bridgerton pouts in his study in the meantime. He's thinking about Penelope. Ruth Jemmel's character, Lady Violet Bridgerton, says they're getting ready to welcome Lord Samadani. She desires Colin's presence to assist Francesca. Colin says he's going to stay out of it. If not, he'll consume every bite of food. Violet brings up Colin's queries from the previous night's gala on friendship evolving into love. According to Colin, all he was thinking about was Francesca. He desires that she find the ideal mate. Dude, quit lying to yourself. Hannah New, who dislikes being called upon, is called upon by Benedict Bridgerton, Luke Thompson, in the meanwhile. That's all right, though, since they can skip the polite conversation and go right to the point. In another scene, Daniel Francis plays Lord Marcus Anderson, and Ajoa Ando plays Lady Agatha Danbury, who eats with her brother. He regales the employees with his tales. Lady Danbury, though, is not amused. She's curious as to why he returned to London. Lord Anderson says he's returned because there's no ladies or society. As we hear throughout this chapter, Lady Whistledown, Julie Andrews leaves heartfelt notes for Queen Charlotte, Golda Rosheuvel in the palace. Reynolds, Hugh Sachs points out that having a second ball will provide him another chance to guarantee Francesca's match. The Queen concurs. Afterwards, Violet, Wool Tilston, Hyacinth, Florence Hunt, Francesca, Hannah Dodd, Eloise, Claudia Jesse, and Gregory, Wool Tilston wait for Lord Samadani to arrive at the Bridgerton home. But then Victor Ali's character, Lord Kilmartin, real name John Sterling, enters the drawing room. Sitting in cosy stillness, he and Francesca periodically exchange pleasant glances. The expected guest, David Mumeni's Lord Samadani, then shows up. Kilmartin leaves, leaving Francesca to stare wistfully at him. In the meantime, Alice, Emma Naomi is informed by Will Mondrick, Martin Zimhangbe that he has had several requests to close his club or give it up, at the very least. He seemed to be torn. The constraints of the ton are becoming clear to the Mondricks. Families from the upper classes go to Lord Fuller's enormous library in another location. Penn is seen by Portia reading a book. Even if it pertains to Lord Debling's field of study, she begs her daughter not to pursue it. When Eloise gets back in touch with Cressida Cooper, Jessica Madsen, she learns that her parents want to marry her after an older guy because she hasn't been able to find a spouse. Colin, the monarch of covert looks, keeps his expression gloomy. However, he accepts his friend's invitation to a night out in the hopes that it will divert his attention from Penn. Penn discusses her preferred literary genre with Debling. Debling presents a fictitious situation in which a guy approaches a woman's mother to ask for her hand in marriage. Oh no, old Debbie will approach Portia and beg if he may wed our Penn. 
I adore Debling because she's a sweetheart. Fortunately, he didn't become an unbearable antagonist from the series. But Pollen's love is too strong. Like magnets, they are attracted to one another. Colin heads back to his women of the evening for a little more sensual fun. He can't seem to get Pen out of his head, though. Instead of doing X, he chooses to observe, even though he doesn't appear to be really interested in seeing two women engage in X. While out and about, Violet and Francesca happen to stumble across Lord Kilmartin. They hear someone playing the violin on the street. Although Francesca is familiar with the song, she finds it excessively rapid. It should be played in three quarters time, in her opinion. Kilmartin takes heed of her words and suddenly disappears. Debling pays Portia a visit the next day. She bestows her benediction upon him. Penelope says Debling hasn't asked her yet after he leaves. Her response is still, no. Portia advises her daughter to take advantage of this chance. All the family will benefit from it. At that moment, Portia believes Penn may be holding out for love. Safety, according to her, is romantic. Violet later gets ready to head to the Queen's Ball with the Bridgerton family. Colin lets his mother know that he would rather remain home since he doesn't feel good. But when Violet says that Debling wants to ask Penn to marry him, Colin's mind starts to race. The gala then features a stunning dance performance, replete with sweeping orchestral sounds. Her Majesty makes her biggest and most intricate wig debut to date. Wearing such gorgeous things must have killed Golda Roshuvel's neck. Lady Bridgerton and Lord Anderson reconcile in the interim. They connect even though Violet's marriage was a love match since they are both widows. In his second act, Anderson wants to find love. Alice is seated in Queen Charlotte's box seat with Lady Danbury. Danbury says we'll ought to go to these things with Alice. He needs to part with his club. Whoever works in the ton will not have the Queen's favor. Danbury offers Alice show him aspects of affluent culture that attract him. Benedict and Lady Arnold meet somewhere. They discuss the ballet with Lord and Lady Fuller. For a while, Cressida and Eloise converse. After expressing regret for her father's actions, Cressida says she has no intention of leaving Eloise behind. In another scene, Colin is sitting in his study watching the candle go out. He remembers that weeks before, Penn had bandaged his injured hand. Decades of friendship sustain their relationship. He heads straight for the ball. Lady Danbury is pursued by Lord Anderson outside the ball. His sister announces that she is going to leave since Her Majesty's Diamond is dancing with Lord Samadani and the ballet is done. Francesca receives sheet music from Lord Kilmartin following their dance with Samadani. It's from the discussion about the street violinist from the other day. Music in question is in the recommended three quarters time. Although Kilmartin says he's not particularly good with words, he thinks gestures can convey a lot of information. Francesca seemed ecstatic. In order for her to play the piano forte, she begs Violet to go early. As Francesca leaves Lord Samadani and starts talking with Kilmartin, the Queen and Reynolds notice her. They don't appear very happy. This would represent the second time that Her Majesty suggested pairing has failed. Philippa and Prudence become aware that they may be expecting a child simultaneously. Due to the pain in their breasts. It's a warning indication. Then, as his friends leave, Colin crashes into the ball. On the dance floor are Penelope and Lord Debling. Penn asks Debling if she thinks their relationship would eventually grow into love. Debling acknowledges that he has no idea what the future may bring. Colin then requests permission from Debling to intervene during the dance. Cressida leaves Eloise quickly, seeing an opening with Debling. He grudgingly agrees to her invitation to continue the dance. Colin is informed by Penelope that he would sabotage her courtship with Debling. Colin maintains Debling isn't the best fit for Penn. Penn finds it unbelievable that he would give her advice on finding a marriage and then reject the first suitor who approaches her. You cannot have both cake and frosting. Following the dancing, Penn finds Debling. Penn is asked why she enjoyed sitting by her home's window by him. Is it that she had a clear view of the house in Bridgerton? Penn has been seeking for someone, according to Debling. Colin's decision to break up their dance is evidence of his affections for her. Penn angrily disputes this saying Colin would never treat her that way. As old friends, they are. Debling doubts Penn's love for Colin. When she fails to respond directly, Debling makes it clear that he is looking for a wife who isn't involved with anybody else. Though he may argue that they are a good fit, I believe he has genuine affection for Penn. Debling leaves. As she watches him go, 
Portia questions what Penn did to for him to end their romance. Penn charges that her mother is only interested in her when there's a ring on her finger. Entering abruptly, Prudence informs Portia that she is expecting. But Portia is preoccupied with watching Penn run away. Colin sees Penn's carriage pulling away from the dance. He takes off running after her. It's quite romantic. Violet watches an excited Francesca playing the Lord Kilmartin piano forte sheet music in the meanwhile. Her daughter is in love, but she isn't with the Queen's match, as she now realizes. Eventually, Colin catches up to Penelope's carriage. He leaps inside. Penn gives her driver the instruction to deliver him first. Penn is shocked that he would jeopardize her relationship with Lord Debling. Colin says she's not the right fit for Debling. He would be gone for the first three years of their marriage due to specific hobbies. Colin skirts the topic until he finally admits that he feels something for Penn. He keeps thinking about her all the time. Colin is eager to go to sleep since he knows he will see Penn more in his dreams. Penelope doesn't think it at first. She believes she is not deserving of love. She acknowledges that she wants more, though. The two have a passionate kiss as a result of this. Oh, it's Poland season. There are many kisses and hands swaying all around us. Colin managed to find her. We adore a man who is considerate of a woman's pleasure. It is warm. Everything is heated. Colin extends his hand to Penn as they get to the Bridgerton residence. He desires to bring her into his house. Ultimately, they are getting hitched. It's about time Colin told his family that Penelope Featherington is his fiance. Mart, follow a predictable. Speed. Indeed. Oh! <laughs> this is just what's our expression for. I can't. Just as surprised as you are. For how long have you had feet? Eloise. Does he know? I doubt. And until he knows. Just let him hear it from me. I just need. Little time for the happy couple. I think you would find her rather common. Allowed, Mr. Dankworth. If we. As to all that Mr. Bridgerton's. A hand in? I certainly do. <laughs> we'll see fit to make. After their sultry carriage ride, Colin Bridgerton, Luke Newton shows Penelope Featherington, Nicola Coughlin into his mansion, as narrated by Lady Whistledown, Julie Andrews. You still recall the two fingers. Naturally, they got engaged recently. As Colin tells Lady Violet Bridgerton, Ruth Gemmell, Francesca, Hannah Dodd, and Hyacinth, Florence Hunt of their engagement, Penelope is stunned. While Violet and Francesca clutch Colin, Hyacinth hugs Penn. Looking less than excited, Eloise, Claudia Jessie walks into the room. With Penn pursuing her closely, Eloise excuses herself. Penn's engagement to her brother astounds her. How long has Penn felt something for Colin, she wonders. Eloise goes on to say that if Colin doesn't know Penn inside and out, he can't love her with all of his heart. Penn would then have to admit that she is Lady Whistledown. Penn says she will inform him soon, she swears. That night, Penn sits in her room, penning the most recent version of her scandal sheet. Luke Thompson's character Benedict Bridgerton and Hannah New's character Lady Tilly Arnold had an early role in the hay the next morning. Tilly takes out her copy of the booklet written by Lady Whistledown. Upon a quick look, Tilly suggests Benedict might be interested in this specific version. Meanwhile, Mr. Dankwith, James Foon reads the lines of Whistledown to Mr. Finch, Lorne MacDonald, Lady Portia, Polly Walker, Philippa, Harriet Keynes, and Prudence, Bessie Carter, the Featheringtons. The only one who appears enthusiastic about his sister-in-law is Finch. Penn listens in on the group to determine how they respond. In another scene, Daniel Francis as Lord Marcus Anderson and Ajoa Ando as Lady Agatha Danbury sit at the breakfast table and take in the news. Agatha is happy that the contest went as planned. At the palace, Brimsley, Hugh Sachs reads Queen Charlotte, Golda Rosheuvel the pamphlet written by Lady Whistledown. It mentions Lord Kilmartin and Francesca's courting in addition to Pollen's engagement. Once more, a Bridgerton chose not to marry the impoverished Marquis, who was the Queen's chosen marriage. L.W., however, doesn't defame the Queen for this mishap. The gossip writer seems to have bit her tongue. 
The Queen grinned. After a protracted honeymoon, Jonathan Bailey and Simone Ashley, the Viscount and Viscountess Bridgerton, return home later. We find out that they are pregnant, and they intend to tell the family the good news. The Bridgertons are obviously in possession of a wealth of good news. When they get back together, Colin tells his brother and sister-in-law about his engagement, which causes them to become very thrilled. Cathany looks radiant. I adore it. Elsewhere, Eloise confides in Jessica Madsen's character, Cressida Cooper, about Poland. Eloise wonders if Penn exploited her as a pawn to get to her brother, as Penn met Colin before her. Cressida concedes that her thoughts are elsewhere. She is to marry Lord Greer, who is not a spring bird, as her parents had arranged. Cressida, nevertheless, makes an effort to see the positive side, maybe she can host amazing parties and go shopping all the time. The Bridgerton brothers then engage in a chinwag. Benedict and Anthony inquire about Penn. How did it begin? Has Colin yet to confess his love to her? When Benedict realizes that everything transpired so rapidly, he asks Anthony whether he intends to duel his own brother. This callback is fantastic. I adore my Benny as well. Colin is encouraged by Anthony to express his feelings to Penn. Penn discovers her mother discreetly gazing out the window in the meanwhile. It still amazes Portia that a scandal sheet contained information about her daughter's engagement. She implies that Colin couldn't possibly love Penn since she finds it hard to believe that they are in love. She also brings up the events surrounding the marina scenario for Penn. Fortunately, Colin hears this. He intervenes, setting Portia straight and ending her fixation with social status. He also professes his love for Penn. After they get married, Colin shows Penn their new house. Readers of books, this is where the much-awaited mirror scene occurs. Colin wishes to display Penn his best features. Clothes are removed, and things become heated and heavy. Colin follows up with Penn to make sure she is happy with this. We like a man who values permission above all else. Colin questions her readiness. She begs him to give her instructions. They sit down on a chaise sofa and he gives her instructions. As an aside, the exhale pen made upon seeing Colin's Mr. Bridgerton had me laughing uncontrollably. If you have been following Luke and Nicola's interviews, you are aware that during one of Colin's sultry moments, they smashed a piece of furniture. As they enjoy the after-coital glow, Penn asks if they can go in for round two. Colin quips that it takes him at least 10 minutes to feel better. They chuckle. Giddy Polin is my favorite. Kate and Anthony are sharing a bed in the interim. They're curled up together. Kate questions if they need to enjoy their good news for a little while longer. Violet has a lot on her plate already. Kate doesn't want Newton to witness Anthony acting flamboyant, which I understand given that his wife is among the most attractive individuals on the planet. He is a little, delicate doggo. In another scene, Violet follows Francesca and Victor Ali's character, Lord Kilmartin, also known as John Sterling. They stroll around the park on a promenade. In order to keep Anthony from waking up during her early morning piano playing, Francesca tells him a story from her early years about how Anthony hid in her piano bench for a week. When John finds that Anthony is back in town, he considers having a conversation with him. John promises Fran he won't ever conceal her piano bench. Kate later organizes Pollen's engagement celebration. When she notices Eloise sitting in a corner, looking hopeless, she tells the staff to go and talk to her. Kate suggests that Eloise express her feelings to Colin on his marriage to Penn. Kate and Eloise together have always appealed to me. I hope their relationship grows. As an aside, I'm more certain that Eloise will be the focal point of season 4 after hearing her mention how everyone is pairing off. She talks to a specific plant father because she feels lonely. Varley, Lorraine Ashbourne then tells Portia that Walter Dundas, the solicitor, has been snooping about once more, inquiring about Jack Featherington. Varley informed Dundas of Portia's absence. She suggests that Portia get to know the Bridgerton family, particularly if Dundas causes the family to run into legal issues. Portia continues to focus on Colin, accusing him of having a social status fixation. She is reassured by Varley that her main goal is to keep her family safe. Portia emphasizes that finding a compatible partner may be difficult for any woman, and she was unaware that Penn was experiencing this. Varley thinks Penelope should hear this from Portia. In the aftermath, Penn and Colin later lay intertwined on the chaise lounge. Penn attempts to persuade Colin into giving her access to his writing. He's still thinking about it. 
A knock on the door abruptly causes our couple to hastily get dressed and leave before anybody notices them. Agatha pays Queen Charlotte a visit in the interim. They are rejoicing, the Queen admits. The most recent leaflet from Lady Whistledown shows how helpless she is. She didn't write any bitter criticism of Her Majesty. It's time to attack and take LW out where it hurts. Colin reads aloud a note from the Queen while in the carriage. A prize of £5,000 will be given to anyone who can tell the Crown who Lady Whistledown is. Colin is happy about this. He thinks she'll soon take off her mask. Naturally, he has no idea that his beloved pen is LW. Pen seemed to be in a panic. Afterwards, Eloise finds her brother engrossed in his work when she visits Colin's office. She requests that they speak. Eloise is offended that Colin went behind her back to propose to Penn even though he knew they were at odds. Colin expresses regret. He declares his undying love for her and says he knows Eloise did too. He wants his sister to approve of them. Colin delivers the Queen's message and the award to Eloise before she leaves the office. Next, Cressida and her soon-to-be husband, Lord Greer, Richard Durden, have a conversation with Lady Cooper, Joanna Bobbin. Greer is a lot of fun, he despises balls, music, and Cressida's Effie trinket outfit. Greer says he'll go to one ball a month with Cressida. Oh, and he figures she'll give birth to at least four or five children. Then Penn is asked by Prudence and Philippa how she was able to snag Colin. Don't tease Penn, Portia tells her pregnant daughters. As it should, the Penn hate train really ends here. Portia discloses that she and Penn plan to attend the Bridgerton home engagement celebration. In another scene, Emma Naomi's character Alice Mondrick observes as her kid lists every cutlery item that is used during supper. Wool, Martin Zimhangbe obsesses over his club's ledgers. Alice requests that her spouse take a week off. Move away from everything. Everyone gets together for the engagement celebration that evening. The son of the Mondricks, the Lord of Kent, plays with Gregory, Will Tilston and Hyacinth. Portia and Colin patch things up. After meeting Tilly, Kate develops feelings for her. Danbury, Violet, and Marcus are in awe at Pollen's compatibility. Penn receives a threat from Eloise in the meantime, before midnight, Eloise will reveal her identity to Colin. After that, Francesca, John, Marcus, Agatha, and Violet have a conversation. John is convinced by Fran to share the tale of his filthy footwear with them. John starts to become apprehensive, though, and his narrative ends before it really gets going. Colin then gives his future bride a heartfelt toast. Eloise continues, raising a glass to everyone who is actually getting to know one another. After that, Portia raises a glass to the union of the Featherington and Bridgerton families. Benedict asks Tilly whether they need more booze or if the alcohol is hitting her too hard. In the drawing room, Kate invites everyone to play charades. Penn initiates the game. The competitive side of Antony emerges. I cherish my insane Viscount. Penn and Eloise race to solve all the riddles properly for a spell. Ultimately, Wool, Benedict, and Portia join in the conversation. Eloise is informed by Cressida that she plans to claim the Queen's bounty for revealing Lady Whistledown's identity. She gets into a brief argument with Eloise. John comes back with Fran to complete his tale about the boots. It touches Violet deeply, especially John's obvious love for her daughter. They're meant to be together. Kate informs Antony that evening that she hopes to share their baby news. She has reconsidered. Penn flees to the shelter of an empty chamber while everyone is discussing Lady Whistledown and the Queen's message. She is breathing heavily. The clock is ticking and Eloise's ultimatum is hanging over her head. Lady Whistledown has it made, Cressida hears Portia say, she can enjoy her celebrity and never have to get married. Cressida makes the decision to go by LW. Penn comes out, panting and trembling. Colin follows up with her. Violet and Agatha are told about Kate and Antony's pregnancy announcement. Then, everyone's attention is drawn to Cressida as Cantony tries to break the news to the group, saying she's Lady Whistledown, she says. Murmurs and gasps fill the room. Portia appears astonished. As the clock approaches midnight, Penelope is so overcome that she passes out. Colin is trying to rouse her awake while everyone is surrounding her. Hey. Betrothal. Well, I had hoped she would report all my news. I too might turn to write in better. She is hellborn. I think she is a G. Cressida Cowper. I've been worried. There's nowhere else I would rather be. 
kindnesses she has written about you. Who sort of might be more. Well, you. There's all this ink leading to it. Writer. He has rescinded under my roof and tarnishing my. Papa, you cannot do that. Aunt Joanna lives in. You do not believe me? Amongst them. We are selling. Members of the ton are perplexed as we start out since Lady Whistledown hasn't released her morning scandal sheet. As Penelope Featherington, Nicola Copland tries to create a pamphlet criticizing Cressida Cooper's absurd statement, we hear Julie Andrews' voice as Lady Whistledown. Penn, however, rips the paper and throws it aside since she doesn't like what she writes. Penn gets a guest, as Lady Portia Featherington, Polly Walker bursts through the door. Following Penn's fainting at the engagement party, Luke Newton's character Colin Bridgerton checks up on her to make sure she's okay. Penn tells him she's alright. Colin presents her with a traditional engagement ring while she tries to hide her hand soiled with ink. It's quite beautiful. In the meantime, Cressida, Jessica Madsen at the Cooper residence is informed by Lord Cooper, Dominic Coleman that Lord Greer has withdrawn his proposal of marriage. She tries not to show too much enthusiasm. Cooper tells her that he is sending her to live with her Aunt Jo in Wales. Joanna Bobbin's character, Lady Cooper, begs her daughter to retract her assertion that she is Lady Whistledown after Lord Cooper storms out. Although she thinks Cressida has abilities, she doesn't think, writer, is one of them. Then, Lady Agatha Danbury, a Joa Ando is informed by Will and Alice Mondrick, Martin Zimhangbe and Emma Naomi that Will intends to sell his club. Agatha exclaims that the Queen will be overjoyed as she rejoices. She advises the Mondricks to make every effort to distinguish themselves from the crowd. Maybe a grandiose ball will solve the problem. Then, in order to get his hat back, Lord Marcus Anderson, Daniel Francis visits Lady Violet Bridgerton's Ruth Gemmell residence. He praises her for entertainingly co-hosting Pollen's engagement celebration alongside Kate. Marcus is asked by Violet about the conflict with his sister. He claims they'll work things out because it's just childhood grievances. Violet follows him out of the drawing room, where she finds Benedict, played by Luke Thompson, Gregory, played by Will Tilston, and Hyacinth, played by Florence Hunt arguing over macaroons. Eloise, Claudia Jesse, who is reading a book, is seated next to Violet. As Colin walks into the room, Eloise puts down her book, curious to know his thoughts on the Whistledown incident. In the meantime, Victor Ali's character John Sterling, Lord Kilmartin and Hannah Dodd's character Francesca attempt to inform the family of something. It's funny how John jokes about them not replying and him having the disease. After gaining her family's approval, Francesca announces her engagement to John. Everyone gives the delighted couple a hug. As Eloise enters Colin's study, he asks her whether she was aware that Cressida was Lady Whistledown. Lying, Eloise says she didn't. She intends to end her relationship with Cressida right now, though. Eloise queries Colin about his plans about Whistledown. Colin says that everything has softened him lately and that Penn's welfare is the one thing that worries him. Oh no, Eloise goes to see Penn later to let her know what Colin said. Cressida is pursuing the LW initiative. Penn says that she had to create a piece that challenges Cressida's authority. Penn is Whistledown, after all. She refuses to let Cressida take away her life's labor. Eloise turns around, dissuading Penn from telling Colin who she is. Then, in order to meet with the Queen, Cressida and her mother go to the palace. Hugh Sachs Brimsley leads them into the throne room. Cressida is asked by Queen Charlotte, Golda Rosheuvel why she hasn't revealed her identity as Lady Whistledown earlier. According to Cressida, she wants to get her prize and lend the Queen all assistance she can. The Queen responds that the genuine LW wouldn't extend such a simple offer of support. Her Majesty threatens to expel Cressida from her court unless the latter prints a convincing issue. Violet, John, and Francesca are having tea together in the meantime. John is aware that the Queen didn't first consider him for Fran. The pair would want Violet to announce their intention to marry Queen Charlotte. She had, after all, already met the Queen. Violet seems uncomfortable. In another scene, Penn's wedding and celebration are being planned by Portia and Varley, Lorraine Ashbourne, 
who remarked that the carriage ought to have gilded flowers on it. On the opposite side of the room are James Foon as Mr. Dankworth, Prudence, Bessie Carter, Harriet Keynes as Philippa, and Lorne MacDonald as Mr. Finch. Prudence and Philippa are jealous. Their mother did not take thus much time to arrange their marriages. They didn't marry men who had endless money, Portia says. Following that, Portia and Penn had a brief conversation. She describes the late Lord Featherington to her daughter as a weak, harsh guy. He treated her badly. Given how uncommon it is to find a love match, she is happy that Penn has. In the meantime, Benedict and Hannah New's character, Lady Tilly Arnold, relish one other's company and a little breakfast. Tilly tells them that she and her buddy Paul are going to host a dinner party. She values Paul greatly. On the last night of the latter's club, Benedict, Colin, John, and Will are seated there. It's about time to close. Will serves them some beverages. Everyone makes jokes about the bad luck. Benny discusses his lack of direction. John quips that he's fortunate to have seen another bottle. Colin discloses that he is penning a travelogue. This moment is really great, especially when you see John's future brothers-in-law getting along. After that, Penn, Portia, Violet, Colin, Agatha, and Marcus go to church, where Pollen's engagement to Agatha is formally proclaimed. Fortunately, no one objections to their upcoming marriage. We find out in three weeks they are getting married. Pollen share a dance in the area where they would exchange vows after everyone leaves the chapel. It's just too cute. Penn admits she has loved Colin ever since they first met. Agatha brings Marcus to a widowed friend of hers outside the chapel. She desires that he avoid Violet. Eloise and Cressida reconcile in the interim. Why did Cressida come forward, Eloise wonders. She claims that her life is lonely. She wants Eloise to go with her. Maybe they could collaborate on writing Lady Whistledown issues in the future. Eloise reminds Cressida of what Penn, sick written about her in the previous year. She admits that she is no longer able to work with or remain friends with Cressida. Cressida snaps in agony. In another scene, Violet informs Agatha about Fran and John's desire for her to represent them in speaking with the Queen. Although Violet respects the match, she is concerned that the Queen may discover her reservations if she presses too hard. Queen Charlotte could therefore feel empowered to reject the match, Agatha continues. Colin and Penn then become involved in the discussion. Violet gives them a big hug while Fran looks on, dejected. She and John appear less enthused about Poland than her mother is. Subsequently, Penn hides her writing instruments under her room's floorboards at the Featherington residence. The Mondricks then get ready to throw their very first ball. Penn goes to the Modishta to choose out fabric swatches for her bridal gown. Penn meets up with Madame de Lacroix, Catherine Drysdale, who wishes her well on her impending marriage. De Lacroix believes Penn will go on writing under the pen name Lady Whistledown and inform Colin of her progress. Penn, meanwhile, says she intends to give Cressida the credit. She is going to stop writing as L.W. De Lacroix acknowledges that she is unsure if she can give up her job as a modishta because she enjoys it so much. M.D. is gently urging Penn to continue writing. Later, Cressida is spotted by Lady Cooper at a desk. As Lady Whistledown, Cressida explains that she is penning a complete issue in an attempt to convince the Queen to award her the £5,000. Lady Cooper reveals that her husband plans to give Cressida her dowry back. Following Cressida's unveiling, Lord Cooper was expelled from his club. Thus, she gives Cressida encouragement to pen that scandal sheet. Although the prize money is little, it could be sufficient for Cressida to survive until she finds a spouse in the country. Cressida is asked to read what Lady Cooper has so far. Still, it's not that good. Lady Cooper's mind is seen to be working. Tilly's buddy Paul, Lucas Aurelio hosts supper for Tilly and Benedict that evening. Paul inquires about Benedict's hobbies. Does he apply paint? Compose? Other than doing his obligations as a member of the ton and occasionally attending balls, Benny doesn't do much. The topic of Tilly and Paul's first meeting comes up. Paul becomes more receptive to Benny once he starts telling jokes. Benny, my child, is really endearing. The Mondricks toss a spectacular ball in the meantime. When Agatha presents her brother to other widows, he appears ecstatic. Abruptly, the Queen shows up. She doesn't appear impressed until the enormous dance floor centerpiece unfolds to show exquisite floral arrangements. Her Majesty gives the go-ahead. She gives Alice a nod. Fran then insists that her mother speak to Queen Charlotte now that she is here. 
Violet is adamant that she will speak with Agatha about scheduling a time at court to talk to the Queen. There is currently too much going on. Fran, nevertheless, takes this to mean that Violet disapproves of John. She walks off furiously. Violet pauses for a moment before getting up to leave the dance floor. Agatha catches Marcus as he excuses himself from his group of widowers to follow her. Here is where we ultimately discover the source of the conflict between the two. Years ago, Agatha came dangerously close to breaking free from her forced marriage to Lord Danbury. But before Agatha could go away, Marcus alerted his father about her escape plot. She was forced to consummate the marriage. This scene features an amazing Ajoa Ando. This scenario is just what I've been hoping for, because Lady Danbury is such a fantastic character. Benedict and Paul then take in some clean night air. Paul goes inside to let Tilly know that Benedict appears willing to participate. Benny witnesses Paul and Tilly sharing a kiss. Benedict is asked to join the couple. Benny, who is clearly upset, gives an excuse, saying he has to get someplace before he departs. Well, I wonder whether he'll decide to join the threesome later on. Afterwards, Lady Cooper and Cressida show up for the Mondrix party. There are whispers and gasps from the entire crowd. Cressida is encouraged to keep her head high by Lady Cooper. As they get to the dance floor, Colin informs Penn he's been working on a novel. She offers to help him modify it. Colin tells her he intends to earn her respect and then abruptly stops dancing. Penn and he see Cressida conversing with the Queen. A message from Lady Whistledown is then brought by servants onto the dance floor, and Cressida lets her work speak for itself. It sounds like something written by Penn. Pulling up her glove, Lady Cooper displays ink smears on her arm. She intervened in order to support her daughter. Impresses, looks Queen Charlotte. She says that when Cressida releases a whole issue, they can talk about her prize. Penn then leaves the dance floor with Eloise in tow. Colin watches as they both walk away. Eloise freaks out, thinking there will be more controversy at the Bridgertons as a result. Penn swears that she won't allow Cressida go any farther. Before Cressida releases hers, she will release another issue. Penn asserts, Whistledown is power. That night, while she scribbles down a fresh Whistledown page, Penn writes to her publisher. She meets Colin after sending it in to be published. Colin discovers that Lady Whistledown, not Cressida Cooper, is his true fiancé. You, fired, that your carriage driver had abducted, is it not you who has been told me all of the things if I was undeserving of your... My true identity would stifle bull houses in Mayfair. Take, for example, Bridgerton House. No. It is engagements. Perhaps one ever wondered why so many. Down is here. I fear we already have it. Fascinating me. What one does out of desperation. Cressida Cow paid to Lord Samson this week, asking for a day off. Except, I suppose, I just. Something that you are not to leave. It's a good thing Miss Carapas was. We pick off just where we left off, with Colin Bridgerton, played by Luke Newton, discovering that Lady Whistledown is actually Penelope Featherington, Nicola Coplin. His sense of betrayal is evident, and to be honest, I think this is Newton's greatest work to date. Colin's haughty exterior dissolves to reveal a gentle, sensitive, and vulnerable guy. I adore it. He leaves irrationally. Later on, the Ton eats their fictitious Lady Whistledown scandal sheet while Jessica Madsen's character Cressida and Joanna Bobbin's character Lady Cooper watch from their carriage. It is fair to believe that Lady Cooper drafted the letter that was given at the Mondrix Ball. She aims at the Bridgerton family. Ruth Gemmell plays Lady Violet, who reads what she says with disbelief. Will Tilston's Gregory and Florence Hunt's Hyacinth request to read the booklet, but Violet won't expose her kids to such hate. Hannah Dodd's character Francesca stays out of the turmoil and concentrates on her novel. Colin is in full brooding leading man mode as he sleeps in bed. But then something amazing happens. Simultaneously, the real Lady Whistledown publishes her issue. We now see Queen Charlotte, Golda Rosheuvel and a confused ton holding two leaflets. While reading Penn's leaflet, Lady Agatha Danbury, Ajoa Ando enjoys the DRAMA that is being caused. 
She is not at fault in my opinion. Penn does her hardest to mitigate the impact of the Cowper scandal sheet and convincingly demonstrates that she is the actual whistledown, all thanks to Julie Andrews' amazing narration. Cressida is confined to her chamber by Lord Cooper, Dominic Coleman, who informs her that she cannot go until her aunt from Wales comes. Afterwards, Penn goes for a stroll in the park with Mr. Finch, Lorne MacDonald, Mr. Dankwith, James Foon, Philippa, Harriet Keynes, Prudence, Bessie Carter, and Lady Portia Featherington, Polly Walker. Now that the Cressida fiasco is behind them, Portia is happy. The Ton can now concentrate on Penn's upcoming wedding. In the meantime, Benedict, Luke Thompson and Eloise, Claudia Jessie go approach the Featherington, Finch, Dankworth family arm in arm. Penn's most recent issue has Eloise feeling quite satisfied. Benny moves aside to make room for the ex-best friends. Colin is aware that Penn is Lady Whistledown, as she discloses. Eloise declines to intervene or provide guidance. Eloise has already unintentionally become the focal point of the drama because to Penn's alter persona. Eloise nonetheless wishes Penn success and gives her credit for placing Cressida in her proper place. After that, Violet and Agatha share a cup of tea. Violet expresses her worries about John and Francesca. She's hoping to talk to the Queen for a little while. Agatha advises against doing this for the time being, acknowledging that the Queen is agitated because to the LW business. Agatha is having some sort of trouble, Violet observes. She says that if Agatha needs someone to listen, she's available to help. I've always valued our friendship so much. Colin confronts Eloise regarding Penn in the interim. Is she aware that Penn is Whistledown from the beginning? According to Eloise, she found out about it a year ago. She didn't believe it was newsworthy to share, though. She really prodded Penn to tell Colin more than once. Afterwards, Colin and Penn get back together to talk about the specifics of their wedding. Violet is shown by Portia the location of the wedding breakfast. The mothers see the conflict among their involved offspring. Colin informs Penn that although their marriage would depend on a number of circumstances, he still plans to wed her. They will need to discuss it after the event. Benedict visits Lady Tilly Arnold, Hannah knew in another scene after escaping her dinner party. Like her friendship with Benedict, Tilly admits that her connection with Paul Suarez is informal. A moment between Benedict and himself seemed to Paul like a sign that a threesome was imminent. Benedict is informed by Tilly that love knows no bounds. It is more than just sex, gender, etc. Tilly continues, her staff is extremely discreet. Benedict considers what she said. Violet is then called by Daniel Francis's character, Lord Marcus Anderson. Sitting in her drawing room is the two. He expresses his wish to go farther with her. Violet is also craving that sweet dessert, and she can't get enough of it. Colin is like his mother. Although she expresses her affections to him, she insists that they settle all their differences first. Cressida, meantime, begs her mother to allow her to leave her room. She also criticizes Lady Cooper for treating the Bridgertons unfairly. Cressida has just one loyal friend in Eloise. Where's Eloise now, Elsie wonders. She tells her daughter that she is the only thing she has in this world. Later, Colin's bachelor party at a club is attended by Benedict, Will Mondrick, Martin Zimhangbe, Victor Ali's character Lord Kilmartin, and Colin. John makes it clear that Violet doesn't think much of him. Violet, as Benedict and Colin clarify, adores grandiose, audacious gestures. She desires a deep affection for each of her children. They push him to venture outside his comfort zone. John and will leave, leaving the two Bridgerton brothers to talk. Although Benedict feels something is wrong, he lets Colin process his emotions. Penn is seated at Catherine Drysdale's shop with Madame de la Croix in the meantime. Penn divulges that Colin is aware. She says that although she attempted to give up her column, it was like taking away a part of who she was. Whistledown provides her voice and strength. Benny is sitting in the study at the same moment, gazing at Tilly's calling card. The vehicle's wheels are moving. Penn is leaving the Modishta when they pass each other on the street. They brawl violently outside the store. Penn expresses regret for all the harm her pen has caused. Colin confronts her for making derogatory comments about him, Marina, and Eloise. Colin questions the sincerity of her remarks on his work, given that she is a well-known scribe in Mayfair. Penn ends this dispute by declaring her love for Colin. They share a kiss. Up against a wall, everything gets hot and heavy until a carriage goes by. Colin makes every effort to keep Penn hidden from curious eyes. 
Then he bids her farewell and helps her into her carriage. Colin then gets back together with Jonathan Bailey and Simone Ashley, the Viscount and Viscountess Bridgerton. Antony and Kate provide Colin excellent marital counsel. I adore Kate's scenes with Cantony in season 3. Simone Ashley embodies Kate in a captivating way. Agatha talks it over with Marcus the next morning. Marcus expresses regret for preventing her from leaving her forced marriage all those years ago. He acknowledges that when he was just 10 years old, he didn't know anything. He wasn't treated very well by their father either. Marcus feels bad for not opposing him. Fortunately, Agatha acknowledges his apologies. They chuckle before Agatha extends an invitation for him to Pollen's wedding. Penn is shown getting ready for her big day in the interim. In other places, a lengthy succession of the Queen's subjects assert that they are aware of the true identity of Lady Whistledown. The possibility that L.W. is not a woman is raised by one man. This causes Queen Charlotte's mind to begin working. Later, a large group of people, including Will and Alice Mondrick, Emma Naomi, enter the chapel for the wedding. Penn is escorted down the aisle by Portia to a performance of Yellow in classical form. Our bride is gorgeous. They exchange vows and the requisite smooch. Even Eloise looks emotional at the display of love. Benedict finds Eloise munching on food alone at the wedding breakfast. The series addresses the loneliness she feels watching everyone she knows getting married. They're setting her up for her season, whenever that may be. Meanwhile, Cressida packs her belongings. A maid arrives with tea, and she asks the maid for help. Kate and Anthony discuss Edwina and her newfound love for the outdoors, thanks to her husband. Kate misses India, prompting Anthony to suggest she give birth to their child there. He wants their kid to know they're a Bridgerton and a Sharma. Kate responds that Violet would be disappointed to miss her grandchild's birth. But ultimately, marriage is about making concessions. I adore Anthony for suggesting this, and I adore this. Here, Cantonese chemistry is just on. Penn, meantime, expresses gratitude to her mother for planning a fantastic wedding breakfast. Although she hasn't had time for her typical interfering, Portia comments that she has sensed tension between Penn and Colin. In the daytime, Penn and Colin get back together for a dance. Penn gets sick of hanging onto the walls, even if it's not a ball. She wants to dance outside with her spouse. Oh no, our newlyweds start dancing to a rendition of You Belong With Me in the classical style. Others begin to notice and join Polin in the fun. Queen Charlotte, Brimsley, Hugh Sachs, and the Queen's entourage appear out of nowhere. All save the Bridgertons are asked to leave. Penn is convinced to stay by Colin because she is now a Bridgerton. The Queen expresses her opinion that one of them is hiding something here. No one is permitted to leave until one of them confesses, she claims. Penn seemed to be in a panic. Francesca informs Her Majesty that she is engaged to John since she thinks their relationship is a secret. The Queen asserts, nevertheless, that it is not her affair. She thinks Lady Whistledown is one of them. Anthony moves forward and declares that he would have quickly put an end to any covert gossip column if it had been written in his home. The Queen retreats a little but says the remaining LW will fold in good time. Penn then tells Colin that she is Whistledown and that she won't change. Colin says he finds that hard to believe. That evening, he intends to sleep on the sofa. After he leaves, Eloise gives Penn a soothing hug. Later, Paul, Lucas Aurelio and Tilly enter her house as Benedict returns. He is eager to enjoy himself. Before he makes out with Paul, Benedict begins kissing Tilly. I'm relieved that the show has at last verified his bisexuality. In another instance, Cressida goes up to a few printers and demands money for releasing her scandal sheet. One of the boys she talks with says his old employer has connections to the genuine Lady Whistledown. He claims that her hair is red. What more does the boy know about LW? Cressida asks. Yes, she will undoubtedly use this as ammunition against Penn. How did you sleep? To Bridgeton House for breakfast. Cressida, the whistle down. Thing makes perfect sense. Lock and key until my aunt arrives to steal me all the Queen's reward, so that I might set up. Miss. I think of how all those she views as enemy, the true Lady Whistledown. Your morning, ladies. Every more, all sisters. 
about me, the seeds of our ruin all along. How well he cannot know about this Lenny's bishop would grant. Well, I do not wish to lie and to follow. Her Majesty has been quite free. It was no accusation. Will you command her to stop writing? She was someone with power. I don't know who Whistledown is. Bridgerton's third season finale airs, and everyone in the ton is buzzing with excitement over the origin of drama. In Into the Light, the Lady Whistledown scandal is resolved, and Penn is shown to be a strong, independent woman. It has been amazing to watch her progress. Although she has always been brave and daring, the storyline of this season has given her more faith in her natural skills. Luke Newton's character Colin Bridgerton is shown in the first scene sipping tea in his new home's drawing room. He appears to be deep in contemplation. As an aside, I adore how his appearance is gradually returning to that of the Colin we know and love, this is especially evident in the way he styles his hair. It's not as untamed and free-flowing as his rakish reputation. Colin dozed on the sofa, and Penelope Bridgerton, Nicola Coughlin comes out of their bedroom. Her maid escorts her to another room, where Jessica Madsen's character, Cressida, is waiting. Cressida admits that she is aware that Penn is Lady Whistledown. If Penn gives her enough money, £10,000 should do the trick, she won't say anything more. She'll let everyone know if Penn refuses to give her the money. Polly Walker portraying Lady Portia Featherington arrives. Cressida takes advantage of the chance to tell Portia Penn's secret. Portia can't believe it. She brings up to Penn all the instances in which L.W. denigrated them in those booklets. Every moment they had to fight to make ends meet. Penn is given some time to consider this by Cressida. Following Cressida's departure, Penn receives advice from Portia not to inform Colin about the blackmail. Penn is adamant that she will never longer lie, especially to her spouse. Queen Charlotte, Golda Rosheuvel and Lady Agatha Danbury, Ajoa and Doa are playing chess in the interim. When the Queen reveals herself as Lady Whistledown, Agatha asks what she intends to do. Put her in a prison cell. Make her cease writing. Her Majesty is aware of Agatha's affection for the Bridgerton family. She will always keep them safe. Agatha speculates that maybe LW isn't attempting to outdo the Queen in any way. She gets the impression that Whistledown is actually a vulnerable person who is grasping at something. Prudence and Mr. Dankwith, Bessie Carter and James Foon and Philippa and Mr. Finch, Harriet Keynes and Lorne MacDonald stroll around the park in another scene. The sisters make the decision that, after becoming moms, they do not wish to disappear from society. They'll throw the greatest ball the ton has ever attended in order to stay relevant. Finch and Dankworth exchange tense looks. It will cost a lot of money. Ruth Gemmell's character Lady Violet Bridgerton, Hannah Dodd's character Francesca, and Victor Alley's character Lord Kilmartin, also known as John Sterling, are having tea. They see that because of the Queen's misgivings, people within the store are gazing at them non-stop. Here, John and Francesca express their want for a modest ceremony to take place at the Bridgerton residence. To Violet's dismay, they then intend to relocate to John's estate in the Scottish Highlands. Fran is eager to stay there and enjoy the tranquility. Afterwards, Colin is asked how he's doing by Eloise, Claudia Jesse. Penn walks into the room with Portia. Colin must be informed about Cressida's attempt at blackmail. Penn tells Portia that Eloise is aware of her identity as Whistledown. Penn claims to have the funds necessary to reimburse Cressida. She has earned a large income from her writing. Colin thinks he ought to speak with Cressida and persuade her to see sense. Furthermore, he doesn't want her to use his wife as a pawn. The next scene shows Paul, Lucas Aurelio, Hannah New's character Lady Tilly Arnold, and Luke Thompson's character Benedict having excess. It's sultry. Then, Colin is welcomed into the house of Lady Cooper, Joanna Bobbin and Cressida. Colin requests some time to spend with Cressida. Lady Cooper grants him a half hour. He asks Cressida to give up on the pursuit of blackmail. He makes an effort to show her compassion. Colin confides in her about his loneliness while traveling. Penn did not reply to his letters, nor did his family. As a result, he tried to adopt a new identity and return to society. Cressida, though, is indifferent to him. He thinks her father will be happy to see her return to society eventually. He states, a family's love is enduring. In response, Cressida argues that he can say it with ease since his family adores him. She is not entitled to such luxury. Colin swerves and informs her that no one will take her word for it if she tells everyone about Penn. 
In response, Cressida strikes back, claiming to have a printer's apprentice who will verify her claims. Cressida allows him to pay her till the Dankworth Finch ball. Oh, and she now demands more cash. Varley, Lorraine Ashbourne intervenes in another scene to assist Philippa and Prudence with their ball preparation. Portia is experiencing too much with Cressida. Penn and Eloise appear to be getting along better in the interim. It seems like no time has gone while they converse. Calm down, my heart of Penelope's. Portia and Colin walk in. Colin discloses that Cressida is now requesting £20,000 and that Penn meant the creases in Cressida's reputation in her column. He says he needs Benedict's approval before making such a big purchase. In other news, Benny is still having a blast with Tilly and Paul. Agatha and Violet discuss Fran's relocation to Scotland at the same moment. Agatha then brings up something we read about in Queen Charlotte throughout their talk. Violet's father had an affair with young Agatha. Violet acknowledges that she already knew this and that Agatha is not the target of her animosity. Agatha feels a weight lift from her shoulders. In addition, she supports her brother's courtship of Violet. The women express their gratitude to each other. Above all, their friendship is paramount. This sight is very amazing. After their fun-filled night, Paul, Tilly, and Benny sleep in a heap. They discuss going to balls and how Paul would never be seen dead there. You cowards, let my throuple go to a ball. Subsequently, Colin is seen standing at the bedroom doorway with Penn. When he sees her in her pajamas, he appears ready to strike. But Colin snatches a blanket to use as a makeshift bed on the couch. Walter Dundas, Edward Bennett then makes his way back to the Featherington residence. He has a suspicion that Portia has not told the truth about what happened with Jack Featherington and how she got her money. Dundas cautions that a more devout family may receive the Featherington title from the crown. Penn approaches her mother once he leaves. She finds it incomprehensible that Portia practically pilfered money from the ton. Penn thinks she and her mother should be better if they both calm down. They have the potential to be better persons. The day of Francesca and John's wedding comes later. Violet approves of her daughter's relocation to Scotland. It's a modest yet intimate ceremony. We see Will and Alice Mondrick, Martin Zim Hangbay and Emma Naomi in addition to the Bridgertons. Following their vows, the delighted couple shares a passionate kiss. John toasts his gorgeous bride and his new family in a most moving way. Violet is asked whether she will dance with Daniel Francis's character, Lord Marcus Anderson, during the Dankworth Finch Gala following the marriage. Observe these two adorable, wild children. God bless them. Violet and Francesca play a piano duet that impresses the tiny audience. Colin is dragged away by Penn. For everything he and his family have done for her, she is appreciative. She now knows how to assert herself and that she can have pleasure beyond her wildest dreams thanks to Colin. He thinks that something will always linger between them if the Cressida situation doesn't get resolved. Penn then addresses a letter to Violet and the Queen. She then hands Varley a large sum of money that she earned from Whistledown. As all of this is going on, Lady Cooper announces that Aunt Joanna is travelling from Wales to pick up Cressida. Right now, it's the only option. When Benedict shows over at Tilly's house, he asks Paul to come along. Paul is with someone else, Tilly discloses. Maybe they should just spend time together, the two of them. Tilly tells Benny how she feels. They had a casual bond at first. She has, nonetheless, recently started to feel things. She's looking for more. According to Benny, Tilly has expanded his horizons. He doesn't want to commit to a single relationship since he has cherished his freedom. Yes, they are making room for Sophie. That evening, Benedict and Eloise enjoy one of their iconic scenes from the nocturnal swing. Eloise shares that she wants to travel the world. She has had enough of trying to fit in and adhere to society. She had better believe she will be the one to transform the world. Benny continues, saying it feels appropriate since what he learns next may completely transform him. Maybe he may be completely changed by someone. The moment for the ball is now. Prudence and Philippa are pleasantly impressed by what Varley created. They find out that Penn used her whistledown funds to pay for their ball as well. The Queen Brimsley, Hugh Sachs and her entourage arrive in style while everyone is dancing. The Queen announces to the assembly that Lady Whistledown is present. She gestures for Penn to come forward. Many people are astonished, including her sisters, of course. Penelope offers her heartfelt apologies to all of the attendees at the event. 
She shares her feelings of helplessness and loneliness prior to taking up a quill. However, Whistledown gave her a voice and agency. She had strength. She swears to speak up in the future on behalf of the voiceless. Everyone is understanding and friendly. Colin looks at his wife with pride. Penn is being studied by Queen Charlotte, who thinks she is remorseful. She makes the decision to permit Penn to carry on writing as long as the quill is only ever used for good. Agatha and Penn eventually communicate after this. Agatha tells Penn how much she's appreciated and that she understood that Penn was Whistledown. She eagerly awaits the upcoming edition. Penn and Portia then had a tender conversation. Portia is happy with her courageous daughter. Both ladies have made significant progress. Poland had a touching moment as well. Colin claims to have come to the realization that she has always been whistled down after reviewing her letters. Her voice is distinct and powerful. He thinks she's really intelligent. These two are just too adorable. They start dancing on the floor. LOE suggests that she and Francesca and John go to Scotland in the interim. She promises to give Fran her space. Eloise wants to see more of the world and get a break from London. Fran obliges, and John expresses his excitement. Then, John introduces his cousin, Michaela Sterling, Masali Badaza, to Fran and Eloise. He hopes they'll all get along swimmingly. Fran looks smitten. She's speechless. This makes her reaction after her wedding kiss make sense. Later, we see Poland having sex as Julie Andrews' character Lady Whistledown narrates the last episode. Cressida and her aunt Joanna, Anna Rudden leave London for Wales. Elle bids Fran and John farewell, and Benedict and Eloise say goodbye. Elle talks about Violet's masquerade party, which she says she wouldn't miss anything. Oh, season 4 will feature Benefee. The Bridgerton family observes Eloise, John, and Fran leave for Scotland. The Featherington sisters are shown playing with their individual kids in a charming epilogue. Penn gets a male, therefore her son will inherit the Featherington estate, Philippa and Prudence have daughters. When Colin's novel, Travelling with Myself, is eventually published, Gregory, Walt Tilston devours it. The grandmothers drool over their offspring. Everything in the world is fine. Colin and Penn plant a tender kiss. The narration of Whistledown finishes with the phrase, goodbye. Rather than Lady Whistledown's signature, Penelope Bridgerton signs the leaflet. An era is coming to an end.